I'm going to talk about uh, the role that the sun has in, uh, uh, on climate. Um, in a sense, it's, uh, uh, we're going to hear more about it, uh, more uh, than what you heard from Professor Ludicke in the morning. Um, what I want to talk about, uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here again in the climate conference. It's uh, always a pleasure being uh, amongst uh, friends. What I want to talk about uh, is the following. I want to uh, discuss first uh, what are the problems with the uh, main story that we hear uh, every day. Um, I'm going to mention a few of the arguments that we hear uh, every day and tell you why, uh, I mean, most of you probably know, but I'll emphasize why we should not actually uh, uh, listen to it or why it carries no weight. Uh, and then I'll go to a few more uh, scientific arguments why the standard uh, polemic that we hear every day is uh, mostly meaningless. Um, at best, or uh, at worst, it's actually there's evidence that shows that uh, uh, the standard uh, scenario, the standard story that we hear from the alarmists, uh, just doesn't hold any water. Um, and one of the main problems that the uh, main standard uh, scenario assumes is that there's nothing else to explain uh, the warming or part of the warming that we've seen over the 20th century. And uh, there is, and that is that uh, the sun has a large effect on the climate. So what I will want to do is explain to you what is the evidence that uh, we see that the sun has a large effect on climate. How can we quantify this large effect that the sun has? And then uh, I will leave the actual mechanism, how the sun is affecting the climate, to uh, Professor Svensmark, who will uh, speak immediately after me. Um, but what I will want to discuss is if we do take the sun into account, how does that affect our understanding of uh, 20th century climate change and, uh, as, as well as what will happen over the 21st century? Okay, so uh, let us begin with uh, the standard uh, polemic that we hear every day. We have the uh, IPCC that tells us that uh, most of the global warming over the 20th century is uh, anthropogenic and that uh, climate sensitivity is high, which means that uh, under, say, a business as usual scenario, if we burn a lot of uh, fossil fuels, uh, the temperature over the 21st century will necessarily increase by uh, quite a lot. Okay, so uh, what are the arguments that uh, they use in order to uh, solidify uh, their claim? So it turns out that there are several types of arguments. Uh, some of the arguments that we hear uh, mostly in the media, not necessarily by the scientists themselves, are totally irrelevant. Uh, and some other arguments, which also the scientists use, uh, are, uh, well, they don't hold any water, uh, to be polite. Okay, so what are the irrelevant arguments that we hear every day? Well, one of the things we hear is the appeal to authority. Uh, this is uh, one type of uh, illogical uh, fallacy the fact that most people think one thing doesn't necessarily imply that they're correct. Science is not a democracy, and even if 100% of the people think one thing, it doesn't mean that they are correct. Um, moreover, if you actually count how many people uh, really support uh, the idea, you'll find that 97% is just the uh, propaganda number that they came up with to sound as if uh, their story is really supported by most of the scientists, whereas in fact it's much less than uh, 97%. Okay, so science is not a democracy, and anyone who tells you that you should believe global warming is real because most scientists believe it's the case, tell him that's irrelevant. If you want to use arguments, use real arguments. Okay, the second thing that we have to uh, always remember is that when people give us evidence for warming, it's not evidence for warming by humans. If you see polar bears floating on ice somewhere in the Arctic and they tell you, oh, the problem is grave, it could be evidence for warming. Um, and in fact, uh, polar bear population is, in, uh, is doing very well. Uh, probably be the best that it has been doing uh, over the 20th century. But even if it was evidence for uh, global warming, it doesn't tell you that it's global warming by humans. Okay, so melting glaciers, rising sea levels or whatever, that's not evidence that it is CO2 which is doing it. Um, and then, of course, there are uh, qualitative arguments. People tell you, oh, the population is approaching 10 billion people. Obviously, we must be uh, doing something uh, to the climate. But who says maybe 10 billion people and the emissions that we have should cause uh, 
a 10 degree increase or a 1 degree increase or maybe a 0.1 degree increase. These kind of qualitative arguments which uh, try to uh, result in your uh, gut feeling bear no weight. I mean, I can tell you, I think that if 10 billion people will spit into the oceans, then the sea level will rise. Okay, that's my gut feeling. Okay, so these are most of the arguments that we hear in the media every day, but they are simply irrelevant. We should, when, when people argue, uh, they should use real scientific arguments. Okay, so now if you go to the IPCC and you try to distill the evidence that they present us, you really find out that it boils down to two arguments. One is that uh, the warming over the 20th century is unprecedented, and if it's unprecedented, it must be a human, or it's unlikely to be natural. And the second argument is that if we try to explain the 20th century with uh, numerical models and we exclude the effects that human humans have had on the climate, we find that uh, we cannot explain the warming. And therefore, you must include human uh, effects in order to uh, explain what's going on. Okay, so the first argument uh, is wrong. Uh, we know from a few years ago that, uh, okay, the third assessment report of the IPCC had this uh, infamous uh, hockey stick graph uh, star. Um, and we know from a few years later that uh, this hockey stick was simply the hockey stitch. What uh, has been done was uh, because temperature reconstruction from tree rings showed us that the temperature decreased following uh, 1960, uh, they just cut out the data and they stitched thermometer data, adding two things which certainly don't belong together, uh, getting this uh, ridiculous uh, graph. So we know that uh, 20th century warming is not unique. We know that in the Middle Ages it was as warm as uh, the latter half of the 20th century. Vikings could uh, map the northern shores of Greenland because there was no ice there in summer. Um, so climate has changed uh, over the 20th century um, and in the past in a similar manner. So this argument just doesn't hold any water. The second argument uh, goes as follows. We can take the radiative forcings that uh, uh, we know we have imposed over the climate. Uh, this includes uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases, uh, the indirect and direct effects of aerosols, uh, the fact that there were large volcanic eruptions which uh, put dust in the stratosphere and blocked some of the sunlight. Uh, we can take all these changes in the energy budget, put them into the global circulation models and try to uh, simulate what uh, uh, water will be supposed to get. And um, on the top right, you see a, a comparison between uh, the measured uh, temperature in black and many realizations of global circulation models which include the effects of uh, humans, which, which include the anthropogenic effects. At the bottom, you see the same thing, but when the anthropogenic effects are excluded. Okay, so this is presented by the IPCC. This is in the uh, fourth assessment report, but the same thing appeared also in the fifth assessment report. If you exclude human contribution to the 20th century warming, you cannot explain what has been going on. Hence, we must include, uh, or the effect of humans is large. Okay, this is the second argument. But these two is wrong. Why? Because it assumes implicitly that there is nothing else which can explain the warming. But in fact, there was something which increased over the 20th century, and that is the sun. The sun is a variable star. It changes uh, its output, it changes its uh, luminosity, and it changes also its activity, which manifests itself in various uh, forms, uh, whether it be uh, the number of sunspots, the amount of UV, the uh, solar wind, um, and so forth. So the sun is variable, and as we shall see, um, it completely overturns the way we see a 20th century climate change and uh, other things related to climate, in particular climate sensitivity. Okay, so these are the two main arguments. Uh, they are completely irrelevant. They, don't, uh, they cannot be used to prove that, uh, that uh, most of the warming is anthropogenic and that climate sensitivity is uh, large. Uh, but before I get into the evidence for the sun, um, let me first 
continue with a few more problems that the standard uh, picture has, which will direct us um, to what the climate really is doing, or what the nature of climate is. Okay, so the first problem is that the size of the warming that we have seen uh, just doesn't fit the predictions. We have seen uh, this graph, uh, uh, I think, yesterday. Um, what we see here are uh, realizations of uh, the temperature increase as predicted by uh, the leading uh, climate models uh, from uh, uh, the 1990s, no, 1980s uh, onward. And uh, on, that's on one hand. On the other hand, you see actual uh, measurements. Uh, you see here the... Um, uh, satellite measurements, you can also use the uh, uh, surface measurements. This is the hardly crude uh, data. And you see that uh, if you exclude the large uh, effects of El Nino here and in 1997, then uh, basically the global temperature is below what the IPCC models predict. Um, this is called the uh, hiatus, the fact that the, there is a pause in the warming. They expect the warming to continue, but in fact, it's just um, evidence that uh, climate is not as sensitive as these models predict. Something is wrong. Another problem is the location of the warming. What we see um, at the top is the um, warming as a function of altitude, um, and uh, in, in red, it's the warming as a function of altitude as predicted by the climate models. Um, at the bottom, we actually see measurements for what the warming was as a function of altitude as uh, measured with uh, radiosons, with balloons. And we see that, uh, indeed, the models fit the uh, temperature increase over the surface, but at higher altitudes, uh, there is something uh, fishy going on. The models predict a temperature increase which is much larger than what you actually observe. So if you had a fingerprint for what the warming should have been uh, from uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases, uh, it should have given you that there is more warming as a function of altitude, but in fact, the observations contradict that. So it means that the nature of the warming is maybe different than what we are being uh, told. Okay, so the f if there is a fingerprint, it doesn't fit. Another problem uh, that was pointed out by uh, Professor Linzen of MIT is that uh, climate models over-predict the temperature decrease following large volcanic eruptions. Large volcanic eruptions put uh, dust in the stratosphere, it reflects some of the sunlight, we can measure how much of the sunlight is uh, reflected back, and that should cause some warming. But you see that consistently when you have large volcanic eruptions, such as Krakatau, such as Pinatubo, the temperature, um, the temperature decrease... Um, uh, this is... This is Krakatau, for example, or uh, Pinatubo. The temperature decrease following the large volcanic eruption is much smaller than predicted by the models. In fact, you can also see it in uh, this graph here, where um, uh, in 1991 we had Pinatubo erupt. The models give you that the temperature reduction should have been very large, but in fact, uh, temperature, the global temperatures decreased by only a little bit. Um, here at the bottom uh, right, you see uh, the average temperature in the several years before and after large volcanic eruptions, and you see that the temperature, in fact, decreased by something like 0.1 degree plus or minus, something like that, uh, compared to the predictions by the models of 0.3 to 0.5. So obviously, the climate models are too sensitive. They are more sensitive than what the real atmosphere is. So then comes the question, why cannot you predict the climate sensitivity using global circulation models? And the answer is that there are several feedbacks in the system, one of which is extremely hard to predict, and that is cloud cover. And what do I mean by that? Suppose we change the energy budget, we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the standard value is that we change the energy budget by uh, 3.8 watts per square meter. If we change the energy budget by 3.8 watts per square meter, we should heat the surface uh, by 
somewhat less than 1.2 degrees. However, if we hit the surface, we will evaporate more water, from, uh, water vapor from the oceans. And water vapor is an excellent greenhouse gas, so that will want to increase the temperature even more. However, if you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, you'll also have more clouds. And the clouds tend to uh, reflect sunlight and reduce the temperature. They also have a, a warming effect, but uh, the main effect is uh, that of cooling. And it turns out that nobody knows how to calculate the effect of clouds. Uh, global circulation models basically include recipes for how the cloud cover will change if you uh, change the temperature of the, or the humidity by given amounts. Um, and the, the climate sensitivity that you obtain from these models is basically almost entirely dependent on those recipes that you choose. So therefore, uh, in computers you call it uh, GIGO, it's uh, garbage in, garbage out. The, recipe that you choose in order to describe the cloud cover is going to give you the sensitivity. This means that you cannot use uh, global circulation models to really predict what the temperature increase is going to be. Uh, here, this is a little bit more technical, uh, just to uh, demonstrate my point. What you see here in the graph is um, on the right hand side, you see the climate sensitivity of the model, and at the bottom you see the a feedback that you have through cloud cover. Basically, if you change the temperature by a given amount, by how much do you change the energy budget in the system through the cloud feedback? And you see that the cloud feedback is the main parameter determining what the climate sensitivity of the model is. Namely, this is the dominant source of uncertainty for climate models. Okay, um, so uh, this also explains why the climate sensitivity quoted by the IPCC hasn't really changed uh, since the first IPCC report, or in fact since the Charney Committee in 1979. Um, the previous IPCC report, the fourth assessment report, they actually changed it from one and a half to four and a half to two degrees to four and a half degree increase per CO2 doubling. Uh, because they wanted to rule out the benign scenarios where nothing bad will happen, but the lack of warming over the past two decades, the hiatus, forced them to uh, reduce back the lower range to uh, one and a half degrees. So, um, it's sad that uh, after billions of dollars invested, we don't know what climate sensitivity is any better. Well, we do, it's low, but uh, people don't want to admit it because um, I don't know why. And well, I know why, but I won't tell you. You can figure it out. Okay, um, another problem is that uh, there's no fingerprints. Uh, you could say uh, CO2, if CO2 have, has a large effect on climate, you should explain, uh, you should expect to see some kind of temperature scale over which you have CO2 variations translate into temperature change. And then you would uh, say, aha, just a second, I saw Al Gore's movie. Uh, and in his the first movie, uh, I actually started seeing the second movie and I fell asleep after 15 minutes. Um, in the first movie, he showed us uh, this graph where you see a temperature reconstruction um, uh, at the top and uh, a CO2 reconstruction uh, at the bottom um, as the ride from ice cores in uh, Vostok in uh, Antarctica. And over these uh, 800 million years, you see that there's a very good correlation between CO2 and uh, temperature. Um, and uh, then Al Gore says with his uh, low voice, uh, <clears throat> which I have today because I have a cold, um, we see that when there's more CO2, the temperature is higher because he wants us to think that larger values of CO2 necessarily cause a higher temperature. What he doesn't tell us is when you have a high enough resolution, you actually find that the CO2 lags behind the temperature by typically a few hundred years. And this is exactly what we heard from uh, Professor Ludicke this morning, and that is that uh, there is an equilibrium between CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 in the oceans, and it takes several hundred years for this equilibrium uh, to reach, which means that if we change the temperature, uh, we change the equilibrium, and therefore we change the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, CO2 should have some effects on the temperature, but this graph that uh, Al Gore has shown us doesn't tell anything, uh, uh, doesn't tell us what this uh, relation is. Okay, and in fact, you can go and look over uh, geological timescales. Over geological timescales, you can uh, reconstruct uh, the CO2, which you see uh, at the top, and you can reconstruct uh, the temperature 
uh, with, uh, in this case, oxygen isotopes in uh, brachiopods or other uh, marine animals. Um, and you see that uh, there is simply no correlation whatsoever between the temperature and the CO2. Do you see any correlation? Well, there was a paper in Science that said uh, there was a correlation, but it's like uh, the emperor's new clothes. This is what I think. Okay, um, so this lack of uh, correlation can actually be used to place an upper limit of about one and a half degree increase for CO2 doubling. If climate sensitivity was any larger than that, then the, you should have been able to see a correlation. But given that there isn't, um, tough luck, CO2 doesn't have a large effect on climate. Well, it's not tough luck, it's actually good that it doesn't have. Okay, so we've seen that there are a lot of problems with the standard scenario. Uh, let's fix them, let's understand what's going on. And the main thing that we should take into account is uh, the sun. As I told you, the sun is variable, it changes its activity, um, and this has a large effect on climate, which, which, which we should take into account. Okay, so this is, I think, one of the nicest uh, a correlation between solar activity and climate that uh, I know of. At the top, you see a proxy for climate, uh, for, so sorry, for solar activity. Uh, this is uh, uh, carbon-14 measured from uh, tree rings uh, all across uh, Earth. Carbon-14 is formed uh, uh, at the top of the atmosphere by spallation. High energy particles called cosmic rays uh, hit the atmosphere. These cosmic rays actually come from outside the solar system. But because they are modulated by solar activity, uh, we get less of them when the sun is more uh, active, and therefore we get less uh, carbon-14. So at the top, we have a proxy of uh, solar activity. At the bottom, we have the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 in isotopes, in stalagmites, in a cave in Oman, in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. Um, and this is a proxy of climate, and in particular, the temperature of the Indian Ocean. What happened is that water with oxygen-18 is heavier than water with oxygen-16, such that the evaporation rates from the uh, oceans are, uh, are different. But they are also temperature-dependent, which means that uh, if the temperature of the Indian Ocean uh, changes, you get systematic variations in those ratios. So at the top, you, you have a solar proxy. At the bottom, you have a proxy for uh, the temperature of the Indian Ocean, and uh, let me ask you the question again, do you see any correlation? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you, okay, so you, you haven't fallen asleep. Okay, um, it can tell us one of two things, it can tell us that uh, the sun uh, is affecting the climate, or it could be that the climate is affecting the sun. Okay, um, another, option, another example uh, which we've seen uh, just the, uh, an hour ago, is uh, the work of uh, Bond. Uh, we have ice rafted uh, debris uh, on uh, icebergs, and then uh, if it's colder, those icebergs can float further south. They melt and they leave it on the ocean floor. So if we dig cores from the uh, ocean floor, uh, we can see whether it was colder or warmer at uh, different uh, epochs and compare that to solar activity. Again, uh, carbon 14 from tree rings, and there was a very nice correlation. Okay, so these graphs tell us that. Uh, uh, the sun has an effect on climate in the northern Atlantic and in uh, the southern Arabian Peninsula, and there are other such correlations that you can find in other places on Earth telling you that the sun has uh, large effects at various places on Earth. But in fact, I think one of the most important uh, results uh, is the following. Uh, you can not only... Uh, see that there, qualitatively there is a large effect that the sun has. You can also quantify the effects that the sun has by looking at the sea level. Uh, plus, uh, we know that the sea level is a, is a global uh, phenomenon. So what we see here, um, uh, in uh, red, we see solar activity. We see uh, solar cycles over almost uh, 100 years. Uh, that's the 11-year solar cycle over which the sun changes its uh, polarity. Um, and in black, we see the rate of change of the sea level uh, as derived from tide gauges. Um, and the fact that there is a very strong correlation, again, tells us that the sun has a large effect on climate. However, on short timescales, most of the sea level change is not due to glacial melting, but 
due to thermal expansion of the oceans. About 70-80% of the signal that you see here is because of thermal expansion. So we can actually use the change in the sea level to quantify the effect that the sun has. We can see how many watts per square meter uh, is the change in the radiative forcing associated with, sol with, uh, with the sun over the solar cycle. And it turns out to be large, uh, about almost an order of magnitude larger than what you would expect from just changes in the solar irradiance. Uh, you can also use other data sets. Uh, this is, for example, a few years after uh, uh, this work was published, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a very nice uh, satellite data published uh, from which you can see what the sea level has been doing over the past uh, uh, two decades. And if you remove the linear trend, which describes a sea level rise from, uh, from various uh, things, the sea level can be explained, or something like uh, uh, 70 or 80 percent of the variance in the sea level, or, or the linearly detrended sea level, can be explained with the sun and El Nino. And, and El Nino. Um, so again, the sun continues to have a large effect on climate. There are other data sets which we, you can use in order to quantify the uh, solar uh, radiative forcing. I've shown you the tide gauge records and the satellite altimetry, but there's also cloud cover variations over the 11-year solar cycle, and you can use uh, measurements of, uh, from the Earth radiation budget experiment to see how much are those uh, uh, variations in the cloud cover, or how much do they translate into changes in the energy budget. Uh, you can use the change in the temperature of the ocean. It changes by just less than 0.1 degree over the solar cycle in order to quantify the effects of uh, the sun, the radiative forcing effect. Or since uh, 1955, there are also measurements uh, deep into the oceans, or, or a few hundred meters, and you can use the actual measurements to measure uh, the amount of heat that the oceans uh, have, and from that deduce the uh, changes over the solar cycle. So you see that you can consistently get the same results from uh, five independent data sets. So these five independent data sets give you uh, that the sun has a large effect on climate, an effect which is much larger than just the change in the total solar irradiance. So that tells us uh, two things. One, the sun has a, a much larger effect, which means that there should be some mechanism which amplifies uh, solar activity. Um, and two, even if you don't know what this mechanism is, we know that the sun has a large effect on climate and it must be taken into account. Okay, so uh, if we open the uh, famous uh, graph from the uh, fifth assessment report, which tells us what is the change in the energy budget associated with different components, um, then uh, we are told that uh, solar, um, the solar contribution is something uh, minuscule, it's this value, but in fact, given that solar activity increased over the 20th century, and given the uh, relation between solar activity and radiative forcing that we know, that we see from the uh, ocean heat content, we can translate that into the contribution that the sun should have had over the 20th century. And it is this value which the IPCC excludes. Okay? The sun has a large effect. Um, it's comparable to what uh, we humans have been doing, but it's completely ignored. Okay, so um, a few words about the mechanism itself. Uh, Professor Svensmark will actually explain uh, more about it. Um, the mechanism um, is actually associated with the cosmic rays, which I mentioned before. Not only are the cosmic rays and the spallation and, uh, of, of, uh, and the formation of uh, carbon-14 through spallation by cosmic rays, uh, not only is it a proxy of solar activity, the mechanism itself is associated with, uh, with the cosmic rays. Uh, so again, cosmic rays are high-energy particles coming from the death of massive stars uh, in our galactic vicinity, uh, stars which typically died uh, 10 or 20 million years ago. Um, the solar wind modulates this uh, flux of uh, cosmic rays reaching us. When the sun is more active and the wind is stronger, less of these cosmic rays can reach can, or can penetrate uh, the inner parts of the solar system and reach uh, Earth. So when the sun is more active, there's a stronger solar wind, less of these cosmic rays reach Earth, and we get less ionization in the atmosphere, and that's because cosmic rays are the dominant source of ions in the atmosphere. 
And then we know today that these ions play a role not only in the nucleation of small aerosols, but also they increase the survivability of those small aerosols as they grow, grow to become large cloud condensation nuclei. So we'll hear more about it by Professor Svensmark uh, in a second, uh, just to, uh, just to uh, make you drool a little bit. Uh, this is an example of uh, some evidence. Um, when there's a gust in the solar wind, there is a reduction, we can see that in red, the reduction in, uh, in cosmic rays reaching the Earth, and we can see in different cloud uh, aerosol and cloud parameters that there is a reduction as well. On a much longer time scales, we can reconstruct the cosmic ray flux using uh, uh, iron meteorites. Um, so at the top, you see a reconstruction of the cosmic ray flux using iron meteorites over the past half billion years. And at the bottom, you see the temperature of Earth uh, reconstructed with uh, oxygen-18, as, uh, as I showed you, uh, that you can do. Uh, but it doesn't have any correlation with CO2. It does have a beautiful correlation with uh, the, the reconstructed cosmic ray flux. Okay, so we know that the sun has a, a large effect on climate. What does it mean? The standard scenario tells us uh, the following. Uh, most of the forcing over the 20th century is due, uh, or change in forcing, is due to uh, human activity. If we now want to explain the temperature rise over the 20th century with this uh, forcing that humans are responsible for, we need a, a climate which is relatively sensitive. That means that... Um, Okay, so we need some forcing times a high sensitivity in order to observe the, uh, or explain the 20th century warming. A, a high climate sensitivity will in turn predict that a business as usual scenario should give us a large temperature increase over the 21st century. However, as I've shown you, there is a very large uh, neglected contribution uh, to the radiative forcing, and that's the solar contribution, such that the total radiative forcing uh, or total change in radiative forcing over the 21st century, sorry, over the 20th century, is much larger, perhaps twice as large as what the IPCC uses. This means that in order to explain the same temperature increase over the 20th century, we now need a climate sensitivity which is low. And if the climate sensitivity is low, it means that the same emission scenario will now give rise to a low temperature increase over the 21st century. Okay, you can actually uh, uh, model it much better. You can build a model which uh, allows for a, 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 um, a free uh, climate uh, sensitivity. Um, you can allow for effects that the sun has. You have to include the fact that the system has a, a large heat capacity. It takes time for the oceans to warm and cool. When people just correlate temperature with radiative forcing, um, uh, they're not capturing a very important aspect of the system, which is that uh, the oceans have a large heat capacity. And the, as a consequence, uh, the climate system acts as a low-pass filter, which means that uh, the response on lower timescales is uh, shorter, and, uh, and therefore you have to uh, model it uh, more uh, appropriately. So when you do that, uh, you can actually fit the 20th century uh, much better. Uh, on the left, we see uh, two graphs. One is the actual temperature measured uh, on Earth, and the other one, and I don't know which one is which because they look almost the same, is the model temperature uh, which we get in a model which allows for the sun to have a large effect on climate. The typical residual that you get this way is about 0.1 degree. On the other hand, on the uh, on the right, you see the same type of fitting that you can find in the IPCC reports, but in these models, you don't allow for the sun to have a large effect uh, on climate, and when you fit, uh, you find that uh, you can roughly explain, but the residuals are still twice larger. So when, if you allow for the sun, you get residuals which are much uh, smaller, uh, which means that you can get a much more consistent picture for what has been going on. Uh, for those models that fit the 20th century, you can then integrate forward in time with many different uh, realizations. Um, 
So this is a vanilla flavored uh, scenario of uh, business as usual where we don't uh, do anything uh, special. Uh, you can integrate it over the 21st century to see by how much is the temperature supposed to increase under various realizations for what the sun will do or what volcanic eruptions will do and so forth. And then you can compare that to uh, the IPCC predictions and see that in fact the predicted temperature increase for uh, a business as usual scenario is uh, relatively benign. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we know that in Copenhagen and Paris, they said, oh, we want to make sure the temperature increase is going to be less than two degrees. It is going to be less than two degrees. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. Uh, there are no arguments that can prove that most of the warming is anthropogenic. There are no arguments or no pieces of evidence that show you that CO2 has a large effect on climate. In fact, there are no arguments that prove the, la the standard scenario that we hear every day in the media. Um, and if you look more carefully, you find that the evidence points to the fact that the sun has a large effect on climate. And when you include that, uh, when you want to try to understand the bigger picture, when you take the sun into account, you find that climate sensitivity has to be on the low side. And that is consistent with various uh, other evidence that we have seen, for example, the low response to volcanic eruptions, uh, the lack of correlation between CO2 and temperature over geological timescales, and so forth. So the sun has a large effect on climate, and the climate sensitivity is low. And today we know exactly uh, how this uh, uh, mechanism works, how the sun affects uh, the climate, and uh, for that we'll hear more by Professor Svensbach uh, in just uh, a few seconds. So with this, I'll end.